dive into God's Word, dig a little deeper, discover the Bible's message for you today. Hello, thank you for joining me today. Our topic today is titled Typology as Prophecy. Some fascinating things that we'll be looking at. I'm glad you've joined me. Whether you're listening on our podcast or watching the video perhaps on YouTube or our website, thank you for joining me. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, as we begin today, we dare not open your word without first asking for your Holy Spirit to guide us and to direct us and to lead us. We recognize that there are things in your word that we can never understand on our own. We must have your revelation, your guidance and leading. And so we pray for this now. We claim your promise to answer those prayers and we thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, what is typology? A typology is the biblical use of a person or perhaps an event. It could be an object or some kind of institution, uh, perhaps. Something in history that points forward to a greater reality in the future. Uh, probably some of the clearest uh, examples of typology in the Bible uh, are things that point forward to Jesus Christ and especially things with the sanctuary. For example, uh, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus approaching the Jordan River as John was baptizing, he pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, John was uh, making reference to the sacrificial lambs that were offered as part of the sanctuary services. And so every lamb was a type of Christ, um, something in history pointing forward to a greater reality in the future. Um, we see another example of typology brought out by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He begins this chapter by recounting um, Israel's idolatry and their uh, rebellions in the wilderness. And then he draws this conclusion in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. He says, All these things happened unto them for in samples or types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Basically, Paul is saying, look, we as Christians are liable and in danger of repeating the same history, the same mistakes of rebellion as the Israelites did in the wilderness. Let's learn from them. Let's not make the same mistakes. And um, he is using this history as lessons and even parallels for what may happen uh, later in time. Some other fascinating uses of typology um, are... King Isaiah and King Jeroboam, two of the kings of Israel back there in the Old Testament time. Both of them had an episode in their life uh, where they rebelled against God. And um, they were both involved in trying to mix the power, the political power of the king with the uh, religious or spiritual power of the priesthood. They both set up an altar. Um, Jeroboam actually set up a counterfeit temple service. He was the first king that split away the ten northern tribes from the two southern tribes. He didn't want his people going back to Jerusalem to worship at the temple because he thought, well, they'll be drawn back to the, the king of Judah. So he actually erected these counterfeit temples, brought in his own priests, set up idols, did the whole thing. And uh, as a result of this, for, of his rebellion, when he... Um, points at a prophet of God who is chastising him and warning him about this, Jeroboam's hand withers up. Um, the prophet prays for him and his, his hand is healed. We'll come back to that in a second. King Isaiah, centuries later, made a similar mistake. He went into the temple and um, the king was never supposed to do that. Only the priests were allowed to go into the temple. And um, as he gets angry when he is also worn by the priests, suddenly a white leprous spot appears on his forehead. And um, he is not healed. He, he is a leper for the rest of his life. Now these two uh, episodes are fascinating because one of these, well, both kings are trying to combine the power of church and state together. And they become um, oppressive to those who are opposing them. And in fact, in threatening the priests' lives. As a result, one hand is withered and the other one receives a mark in their forehead. In Revelation chapter 13, the mark of the beast is, um, it comes about through a union of church and state as worship is being mandated at the end of time. 
There's also oppression. Uh, Revelation 13 says very clearly that if you don't go along and receive the mark of the beast, there's a death penalty attached. Just like these kings were trying to kill the priests that were warning them not to do this. Now, the mark of the beast can be placed, according to Revelation 13 and 14, in the hand or in the forehead. And so these two stories in the Old Testament are types. Uh, they, it's using typology to illustrate some of the issues connected with the mark of the beast. Events in history that will have a greater fulfillment in the future. While Jeroboam and Isaiah's rebellion and mistake was localized, you know, in their little kingdoms, at the end of time, the mark of the beast will be a worldwide phenomenon that is happening. Uh, and so this is how typology works. Now, we're going to take a look at some stories in the book of Genesis that are types of the investigative judgment. If you were joining us for our study, our previous study yesterday, we were looking at the investigative judgment. And we're going to look now at some stories that will help us understand why God goes through the process of investigation. Because maybe you're thinking, why would God need to investigate anything? He already knows everything, right? And you're correct. God does know everything. Unlike on earth here when there's a crime committed or, you know, a court case, uh, we have to sift through the evidence. We have to do an investigation to determine what is truth. God doesn't have to do that. He already knows what is truth. Uh, but there are some other important reasons to go through a process of investigation. So we'll see how many of these stories we get through. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3. And if you know Genesis chapter 3, you know that this describes or recounts the story of Adam and Eve's first sin, their fall, their rebellion from God. And um, in verse 6, we read that Adam takes the fruit and he eats just as his wife Eve had done. And verse 7 says, The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, so they know they've sinned. Now what? You know, there's some embarrassment and shame. They realize they're naked. Uh, there's also some fear involved because they know sooner or later God is going to come. And sure enough, verse 8 says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, what is God going to do next? He already knows what's happened, right? God knows everything. It's not a surprise. He doesn't need to investigate the situation to determine the truth. Well, did Eve actually eat from this? Uh, did Adam actually take you know, that apple, whatever it was, from his wife? God knew this already. But look what God does. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Now, that's an interesting question for God to ask. Does he know where Adam and Eve are? It's kind of like me playing hide and seek with you know, my, my little children. As they try to hide behind a tree this big or whatever else that they can't hide behind, you can see heads and feet and shoes sticking out everywhere. But I'll pretend like, Oh, where is my little boy? Where is my girl? Is this what God is doing? Why does He say, where are you? Of course He knows where Adam and Eve are. But He's asking the question for a purpose, and that is to give them an opportunity to respond to Him. And that's the first big uh, lesson that we need to learn about the investigative judgment. It is not so that God has an opportunity to finally determine what is truth or not, to determine who is serving Him and who's not. He already knows this. But the investigative judgment is a process that God goes to, goes through, to give us an opportunity to respond to Him. Genesis 3 goes on, and um, they, re, they answer God, and, or Adam does, and he says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God asks another question, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat of? Now, does God know what Adam has done? Of course he does. Why does he ask him the question? Why doesn't God just come and say, Listen, Adam, I told you not to eat from that tree, and you ate from it. You're out of here. Get out of the garden. God doesn't deal with it that way, does he? Instead, he asks him, Have you eaten of the tree? Why does he ask the question? Why does he investigate? It's so that Adam can have a chance to confess his sin and to say what he had done wrong. Adam doesn't take the chance. 
Instead, he points at Eve and says, it's her fault, right? And we continue to do this, to do this today. We blame other people for our mistakes. Uh, it goes all the way back to the first sin, Adam and Eve. But here's the point. God goes through the process of investigation with Adam and Eve, not to determine the facts, God knows that already, but to give them a chance to respond to him and to confess their sins. And that's the second big point, friends, about the investigative judgment. It is an opportunity for us to confess our sins, to seek forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness, to claim the promises of God, and to experience the righteousness of Christ in our lives. In Genesis 4, we have the sad story of two, the two sons of Adam and Eve, or two of their sons probably, Cain and Abel, and Cain killing Abel. God also goes through a process of investigation with Cain. In Genesis 4, verse 6, the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? I'm sorry, wrong verse. Uh, verse 9, after Cain kills Abel, God says unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Does God know? Of course he does. Why does he ask Cain? He is trying to give Cain an opportunity to respond to him and to confess his sin. How does Cain respond? He says, I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? And so Cain does not take advantage of that opportunity to confess his sin. But this is why God investigates that sin. Moving forward to Genesis chapter 6, the, the beginning chapter of the story of the flood, uh, we see that God also investigates um, the spiritual condition of humanity. Genesis 6, 5 says this, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so God is again investigating, going through this process um, of seeing what the true heart condition is. And this is the third big point about the investigative judgment. It's really about heart condition. Uh, am I serving? Am I worshiping God? Uh, in heart truly because I love him or am I doing it because I am afraid of God or have I rejected God for some other reason? It's issues of the heart. Just a couple more stories. We're almost out of time today. After the flood, um, some of the family of uh, our descendants of Noah end up building this gigantic tower. Um, we call it the Tower of Babel today didn't please God because it was being built in rebellion to God's authority. And so he comes down and he stops the building by mixing up the languages of the people. But before he does that, we read in Genesis 11 verse 5 that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and at which the children of men built. He goes through a process of investigation to uh, see... Uh, or before he carries out the execution of the judgment. One last story, very quickly. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah, recorded in Genesis 18 and 19. And if you know the story, God sends two angels to destroy these very wicked cities. But before he does that, he has a conversation with Adam. And um, we read here in Genesis 18, verse 21, God says to Adam, I will go down now and see whether they, that is Sodom and Gomorrah, have done altogether according to the cry that has arisen to me. And if not, I will know it. And so God goes through this process of investigation. Well, immediately after this, Abraham begins asking God, will you save the city if there's 50 righteous people? Yes. Will you save the city if there's 45 righteous people? Yes. And Abraham comes all the way down to 10 righteous people. He is interceding for the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and for his nephew Lot who lives there. And this is the, the last big point about the investigative judgment that I want to make today, friends. The investigative judgment is a time period when Jesus Christ intercedes for you. He intercedes for your family. He is interceding for uh, anyone who will come to him, confess their sins, give their life to Jesus Christ, and trust him to be their savior. So the investigative judgment is good news and we can find pictures of it or typology of it in many places in Scripture. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope that you'll join me again tomorrow.